All right, hey everybody. Uh, welcome to another Tuesday Tech Talk. Uh, today we have with us uh, John from uh, Disney's Studio Technology Division, and I think you're going to be talking to us about uh, your very uh, elaborate title, Preventing a Meeting Wildfire. So uh, without further ado, take it away. Make sure your mic is on. Give it a test. Rookie mistake. There we go. <clears throat> All right, uh, yeah, I'm John Walski, or John Walski, if you uh, concatenate it, on GitHub, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, whatever. Uh, not a whole lot to discuss there. That's me. <clears throat> I'm just going to jump right into it. I want to know, has this ever happened to you? You've got a problem, and you come up with a solution, and you start to tell some of your friends about it. And the idea catches on, and it starts to spread until somebody says, we need to set up a meeting to talk about that. Now, maybe in the kind of work, you guys are very agile here at Pivotal, and, and you're consulting your different projects, but you probably work with organizations that work this way. Like, <laughs> somebody's got an idea. We need to have a meeting about this. And then by the time you get to the meeting, there's, like, people you didn't invite there. There's people you've never seen before. It's just spreading out of control. And so you've got this big meeting over here, and somebody looks up and says, hey, did you hear those guys are meeting about that thing? We better get management involved. <coughs> and you're just like, I'm just trying to code, man. <laughs> like, I've got this thing I'm trying to do. Uh, only you can prevent meeting wildfires. And I'd like to talk to you about a technique we've been using in studio technology. Uh, to help to that effect, called architecture decision records. Now, I know I said architecture and records, and so don't jump out of the boat just yet. <laughs> like, like, oh, we're agile now. We don't do architecture. We don't do records and documentation and stuff. So before I get into it, I'm going to take a little detour through the Agile Manifesto. We, uh, we all, we're all familiar with the Agile Manifesto, right? Agile development. I, okay. I, making sure I know my audience here. Um, working software over comprehensive documentation. This is one of the principles, or, or one, of the, one of the four key values in the Agile Manifesto. So we like working software. That's where we deliver value. Uh, we even value that over our value of comprehensive documentation. This is also in the Agile Manifesto. There's value in the items on the right. We value the items on the left more, but they're both valuable. So documentation is not inherently evil. That aside, we can go into this. I've mentioned the topic, haven't even defined it. An architecture decision record is a short text file. Each record describes a set of forces and a single decision in response to those forces. This is Michael Nygaard, author of Release It. Uh, he's also, I think, one of the authors of Evolutionary Architecture, or a, a big person in that movement, uh, and all-around smart guy. Um... Some other people think this is a good idea. This is the most recent ThoughtWorks technology radar. And if, you're, if, if you've read the tech radar, you'll know they've got four quadrants, techniques, tools, platforms, languages, and frameworks. Uh, and then they've got these different categories of, you know, uh, to what extent they want to lean into a particular technique or technology. In their uh, techniques quadrant, Lightweight architecture decision records was the only thing to land in the adopt ring. So ThoughtWorks thinks it's a pretty good idea. Maybe it's worth checking out. Uh, quick thing. I'm going to use the term architecture decision records because Nygaard did and because ThoughtWorks does. But really, they're just decision records. So if you're making decisions that are technical in nature or not uh, and you need to communicate them, this technique is still useful, regardless of whether or not it's something might, someone might consider architecture. And really, more important than architecture and records is the decision part. So I'm going to focus on the decision part. Uh, so let's look at some examples of some ADRs. Uh, this is one that we had at work. Looks like it probably didn't take a long time to write this document. You don't need to read that. The, the important thing is we've got a title. A status, did we finish the decision or not? Are we still working on it? Context, 
again, lay out all of those forces that we were talking about that might be in conflict with one another, how we're going to resolve those forces. What was the decision that was made? What are the consequences? Positive, negative, neutral. And that's really all there is to an architecture decision record. A big part of this and, and why ThoughtWorks calls out that it's lightweight is that it's lightweight. It's, it's low effort, minimal overhead to create, minimal overhead to maintain, just some quick documentation of a decision that was made. Uh, here's another example. Uh, one of the teams I'm working on, they use Confluence for everything, and so we have a wiki, and I noticed, hey, there's a, an affordance in Confluence for capturing decisions. Uh, when you hit that Create button, and it gives you your templates of what do you want to create documentation of, one of those options is a decision, and it has a template for you, and you can say, uh, my status, I haven't started it yet, or I'm in progress, uh, here's the person who owns that, other people that need to be involved. They don't say context, they say background, but it's effectively the same thing. And so I can go through that template there and stub out my architecture decision record, and then Confluence will give me a list of all of my ADRs for that particular project. So all the things that still need to be decided that are kind of out hanging, the things that we made decisions on that other people might care about, they might have an opinion on it, and instead of setting up a meeting, they can just read the documentation. Here's another example. The tech radar is itself documentation of decisions that were made. Uh, all of these. Well, I, I like to point this one out because there's something unique about the technology radar. Uh, one thing I really like that ThoughtWorks does is they call out the degree to which something is uh, an accepted solution, right? So they've got their assess, where this looks interesting. I think we're going to try this. They've got trial. Okay, let's actually try it and see how it goes and see if we want to do it again. And then, yeah, that was good. Let's recommend that other people do this as well. We're going to adopt that. And then maybe there's, we tried that. It really didn't work out. We recommend everybody hold on that. We're not going to do that sort of thing. So I really like that the ThoughtWorks tech radar calls out sort of these different rings of how accepted a solution is. I want to look at one more example. This has some novelty to it as well. The project itself doesn't really matter to me. Um, this is uh, some component within the Eclipse project. I really don't know what Winery does, but what I what really caught my eye was this right here, docs slash ADR. They are using a tool called ADR Tools, just a little CLI tool for capturing a quick ADR, and they check it in with their code. This is something that Nygaard recommends. It's something that ThoughtWorks recommends. Uh, so actually, counter to my practice of putting it in the wiki, they really strongly recommend, and I, I think I agree with them, that it's better to put that in the code so that you've got the documentation along with the code that it documents, so that as your code evolves, your documentation can evolve with it. Uh, if you want to discuss changes or have some sort of approval process for changes to the documentation, you can always do that in a pull request, just like you would with code. Uh, so it, it's, it's a pretty neat little tool, and it's really easy to get. It's just brew install ADR tools, and you've got it. So... Uh, just for kicks, I'm going to take a little test drive here. All right, so here I've got just a vanilla app. Let's see what we got here. This is, this is a Rails app. Um, so nothing much. This is like Rails new, and that's what you get. I haven't done much else with it. Uh, so let's... All right, look at that. We've captured our first architecture decision record. Let's see what that is. Uh... <laughs> Man, I found my caps lock key. All right, so our first decision was to capture decision records. This is like the most meta ADR ever. So you can see it's just a simple markdown file. There it is. Hurrah. Let's, uh, let's create a new one. Oh, this is a Rails project. We're going to need a testing framework. So let's say... Um, Use our spec for testing. All right, now I've got an ADR stubbed out for me. Uh, you can see my title up there, use our spec for testing. Status, um, I'm gonna say it's sec accepted. We're, we're done with this, it's a made decision. Uh, use our spec. Well, that could have gone better. Anybody like the new, uh, touch bar on the, on the Mac. 
you know, any Vim users that's like, I know, I should remap escaped caps lock or something like that. But uh, all right, so we will use our spec for testing. Huzzah. Consequences. I'm going to come back to that. Context. Right, right. So, I mean, that, that could get into here. So maybe I jumped the gun on this, this ADR here, uh, which really leads me to the next part of this, which is one of my favorite quotes of all time. Leslie Lamport, uh, Turing Award recipient, says, writing is nature's way of revealing how sloppy our thinking is. I love this. It, it applies not just to software development, but really in general. You know, uh, we see this as engineers, coding is sort of nature's way of revealing how sloppy our understanding of business processes is, right? Like you go to like, oh, the customer should be able to whatever. And then you go to code that and like, well, we need to know exactly what that means in order for it to become code. Writing kind of has the same effect. Uh, we can make it a little bit more germane to this discussion. Capturing ADRs, architecture decision records, is nature's way of revealing how sloppy our decision making is. And this is really the main reason why I like capturing ADRs. It's nice to have the record, it's nice to prevent the meeting wildfires, but really it forces us to think about not just the decision we're making, but our decision-making process. How do we make important decisions? How do we make technical decisions? And we make a lot of decisions, right? Particularly if you do uh, maybe node development and there's a million different packages for every little thing that you need to do. Or Rails, I mean, maybe to a lesser extent, you've got, you know, which gem are we going to use for this thing? And then you've got broader decisions. Um, are we going to have a RESTful interface? Is this going to be, you know, REST for communication across components? Or is this going to be message-oriented? And if it's message-oriented, is this Rabbit? Is it Kafka? Is it, uh, you know, SQS? Lots of different decisions. I was laugh. Uh, I was filling out some information for a for a vendor to get like early access to some feature, and in their questionnaire, you know, it's what's your email address, what's your job title, whatever, and then it said, "Are you a decision maker?" I thought, well, I, I just told you I'm an engineer. Of course, I'm a decision maker. <laughs> I make micro decisions all day, and it's exhausting. <laughs> but how do we make these decisions? Uh, hunch is it what's trendy? It's easiest, the loudest opinion. We like to think that we don't do this, but how many times are you looking for a library and you look at like, how many stars does it have on GitHub? How many downloads does it have on NPM? Uh. And then how do we know it was the right decision? And that's a trick question, and I'll get to why in a minute. Maybe it's better to just say, how do we know it was a good decision? Because whether or not there's a single right decision is often, often debatable. Uh, you can meet people who are vehemently opposed on their ideologies, and yet somehow they both manage to deliver working software. So uh, maybe there are cases where there's a, multiple good decisions. And how do we communicate that decision once it's been made? We just yell across the room, bring it up at stand-up, bring it up at retro, none of the above... At some point, the assumptions that led to this decision may be invalidated. Might be time to revisit that. So that gets into the concept of decision frameworks. And I'm going to do just a quick flyby. I, uh, just for the sake of time, I don't want to like go deep on any one particular decision framework, but I just want to point out that like, decision frameworks are a thing that people can get into. Uh, this one is based on a paper called Reusable Architecture Decision Models for Enterprise Application Development. And by that title alone, you can see why it pulled me in. <coughs> but uh, now, uh, one of my colleagues just calls it a framework toward better decisions and summarized it much better than the paper was. Uh, like any good process diagram, you want to have your inception phase, your execution, and your transition. And so that's what we've got. Decision identification, decision making, and communication. Kind of arbitrary to break it into three points, but we did. So you've got to identify your problem, describe it, describe the context. That's where those conflicting forces come in. Your problem exists in some context. Make the decision. 
What are others doing? How do you evaluate your alternatives? Choose those alternatives. Um, and then there's the communication aspect, sharing that decision out to not just people within your team, but stakeholders from outside of your team um, that might be prone to calling meetings after the fact. So let's talk a little bit about phase one here. And has anybody heard of this? This guy. Has Henry talked about this? Okay, because I know he's a big fan and he's been here before. Anyway, um, I've heard it pronounced Kinefin. I've heard it Kinefin. Kinefin. Okay. It is Welsh. It is a Welsh word. And it means well-being. And it's not so much a decision-making framework as a sense-making framework. But the idea, uh, just in broad strokes, you could have an entire talk on this framework. It's, it's deep and it's awesome. Uh, essentially, there are five regions that you could be operating in. Uh, the complex, the complicated, chaotic, obvious, and then this region of just disorder. Um, and mostly, when it comes to agile development and lean business practices, we're operating here, where what we're after is kind of emergent, right? Like, uh, agile delivery is all about Build something, deploy it in the marketplace, see what users think, gather feedback, lather, rinse, repeat, right? It's, it's always embracing change, right? Uh, and so we, we typically live here where sometimes we're defining what a good practice is. Now, maybe not in software development, but in what that application that we're building does for its users, that's often emergent. Now, what we're doing in software delivery tends to be in one of these areas, right? Um, I mean, there's the obvious, right? There is a best practice here. Suppose the question is, should we use version control? Yes, that's obvious. You should use version control. Which version control should we use? That probably still lands in obvious at this point. I mean, if somebody came along and said, hey, we should use Foundation. Team Foundation Server. Like, oh man, we don't even have to talk about it. Like CVS. Uh, subversion, Ooh, I loved it, but it's not decentralized. So, I mean, like, just use Git, come on. Uh, but I say that and there's always like one systems guy who's like, well, actually, there's this thing in Mercurial that we really need. I'm like, fine, okay. There could be an argument made for one other thing. So maybe it's not quite obvious, maybe it's up here. Uh, and, uh, complicated, you've got more constraints, right? But they're, they're, they're defined, like they're, they're, they're hard constraints. There's not as much flexibility. This is rigid. And so uh, it, it's not obvious, but it's also not complex. Um, just complicated. So this is when you get into a lot of like compliance requirements. You know, if you've got PCI or HIPAA or whatever, there's a lot of things you have to do. They're all really well stated. Uh, chaotic, the server's on fire. Like We've never been in a situation where the server was literally on fire. What do we do? Um, Fire extinguisher, this guy knows. Uh, maybe don't use servers anymore. Use the cloud, I don't know. <clears throat> but in a situation that's chaotic, you're trying to just figure out how to get out of chaos as fast as you can. And so your, your strategies are different. You need to act now and then sense what's going on based on your actions. So uh, I probably dwelled too much on this because I, I really haven't gone deep on this. Again, you could have a whole talk on this and it would be awesome. Um, maybe I'll get Henry to come out and do that. Here's another thing uh, in terms of quasi-decision frameworks, uh, just being in architecture. I felt like I couldn't have a slide and not have quality attributes somewhere in my presentation. So this is kind of a thing for architecture, particularly if you look at uh, Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, they're kind of heavy process. But they have their quality attribute workshop and you're trying to figure out really a lot of the non-functional requirements. And that can be challenging, particularly when you're with a team that's first getting into agile practices, right? So they start doing user stories for the first time. Um, a lot of times your user stories are functional requirements, but there's no user story for scalability or reliability or modifiability. Uh, but those are still important things. And oftentimes because they're not captured, we're just left as, as product developers to figure out, I think security is important to this business unit. We haven't said that it is, but it, it probably is. 
one of the greatest stories I heard about this was uh, a guy was doing development on uh, some software for like a, a, a government security agency. And so he just had the assumption that security is going to be a very important software quality attribute for this agency. And uh, he's going through his designs and there's some pushback and he says, well, you, obviously security is going to be your number one priority. And they said, well, well no, not for this project. It's, it's going to be on an air-gapped computer in a room not connected to the internet with an armed guard outside. We don't care about security at all. So, so I don't want to push like some heavy like architecture framework process on you on your projects, but there are software quality attributes that are often at odds with each other. These are potentially conflicting forces, and somehow you have to determine which ones are significant to the business that you're serving. Uh, and again, I could like do a whole talk on just software quality attributes and non-functional requirements. And I've got a friend at ABC who does this great three-part series on it, but like we've got so much time for today. So just know that like uh, Kenefin's a thing, software quality attributes are a thing. It might be worth looking into after the fact. <clears throat> uh, but let's get into kind of the next phase into decision-making. This is a friend of mine, Josh Dunn. I need to update that. He's not actually with Microsoft anymore. Uh, if you're watching, sorry, Josh. I'll get it right next time. Uh, but I love this quote from him. He used to say this all the time. Effort in planning should be directly proportional to the indelibility of the decision. In agile development, we really embrace change. And a lot of times, rather than try and figure out what's best, what's like the right decision, the correct approach is just make a decision, see what doesn't work, and make another decision. That's, a, that's like at the heart of Agile. There are some cases where the cost of change is high, right? And so there's some things where, okay, it's worth doing a little bit of what we'd say just enough upfront uh, investigation to see if a decision is correct. And you might see this in something like Code Complete or any kind of book like that where they talk about cost of change and how cost of change uh, differs in different parts of the project and, and certain things are easier to change. So, you know, if I want to change from maybe my previous example, let's say I was using a Rails app and I was using one particular library, maybe Paperclip to do attachments, but now I want to switch to doing something else. Okay, it's going to be a little bit of work to change, but it's an implementation detail, we'll change it. Uh, then on the other side, we want to change, uh, maybe like I said earlier, we've got different software components that need to communicate and we were going to use um, REST over HTTP, and now we're going to shift and go message-oriented, and we're going to use uh, Kinesis. Well, that's a huge shift, and the cost of change there is going to be huge. Um, and so when you're making a decision like this, you can justify more time spent making the decisions for what you're going to do. So this is where it makes sense to get some people together in a room in front of a whiteboard and figure out how this is all going to play out and really think about your decision-making process. As an example in the other extreme, this is one of my favorite ADRs of all time. Uh, a few years ago, I worked uh, with a team building some budgeting software called Every Dollar. I don't know, anybody heard of that? It's not super popular out here. They've got like a million users. Anyway, uh, and they had this captured as one of their ADRs before I got on the project. And I love it. Like, we need to agree on a single standard. Yes, that's correct. We want to reduce diff noise. Decision, use spaces, not tabs. What was our rationale? We flipped a coin. <laughs> but they still captured it as an ADR so that when somebody else comes on the project and says, well, have you guys thought about this or that? Like, no, no, no. We flipped a coin and we're identifying here that that's the extent that we want to invest in this decision. So let's move on. Mm, I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. So we've identified some decisions we need to make. We've made some decisions. Now how do we share those and, and communicate them out and control them as they change? Uh, real quick, we'll stop here. Uh, evolution trace, that's, I don't know, kind of convoluted wording. Really the idea here is just that ADRs are immutable. Once you capture a decision, you don't change the record. You just make new records. Just like 
you can't go back in time and change your decision, but you can revisit the decision and make a new decision. That's the opposite of it. Uh, and this is, I don't know, I almost don't put this in here because it's kind of analogous to the idea of logs versus tables, right? Like you can have your event stream of all the things that happened and this is how databases do their replication, right? You've got your write ahead logs of everything that happened and then the database engine exposes to you the summary state of based on everything that's happened, this is the current state. Same principle with ADRs. These are all the decisions we made as individual records, but you can say this one obsoletes this one, obsoletes this one. Just like RFCs if you ever Read those to help you go to sleep at night. Uh, so that's kind of the control aspect of it. When you revisit a decision, you want to just, if you're superseding a previous decision, link it together. And the, uh, the ADR CLI tool that I mentioned earlier has an affordance for referencing another decision uh, and, and linking them up. The other thing that has to happen is this communication aspect. So I made a decision within my team for some sort of technology. Maybe it was we're going to use Salesforce for this project, or we're going to use MySQL, or we're going to use Postgres, whatever. I made some decision and somebody who was not in the room is going to care about that decision. So I probably need to communicate that out. I might even need to have a meeting. And I know I presented this whole thing as preventing meeting wildfires, but I didn't say it was for preventing meetings. So. Sometimes you have to do a controlled burn. And this is where you have the meeting so that you only have to have one of them. Uh, because if you try to just avoid having the meeting, sometimes you wind up having it four times. Because uh, like, well, this person's interested, they want to you know, voice their opinion, give you your, their two cents. And then this person sees, oh, those two guys are talking about it. I need to get on that. You have the meeting again. Then the next guy comes in. And, and so we're preventing the meeting wildfires. Uh, and, and controlled burn is kind of derogatory because we're essentially saying communication with people is a bad thing and something to be avoided. And that's not true at all. Agile principles, we prefer communication. One of the principles is that face-to-face -face communication is the most efficient means, right? So we're not opposed to face-to-face -face communication. And, and so maybe controlled burn, if I'm, I'm just going to beat up this fire metaphor and just stretch it as much as I can, maybe... <laughs> Maybe instead of a control burn, we have a bonfire, right? We're going to have an intentional fire. Everybody's going to bring their passion, bring their fire with them. We're going to have a big fire. And it's going to be wonderful. And we'll roast marshmallows and have a good time. Uh, but the point is, we have to intentionally communicate with people. And those people aren't necessarily around making the decisions with us. They might not be on your uh, solution delivery team. They might not even be on your product team. So sometimes it's, you know, I've decided that I want to use my SQL for this. I know everybody else is using Postgres, but, you know, freedom and responsibility, we're going to use MySQL. And what you didn't know is, well, there's a systems engineer over here who's not even on your team, and his job is figuring out high availability and backup systems and, you know, uh, multi-master replication. Well, by choosing a new database technology, you just, made his, you just gave him a lot of work. And so we have to recognize sometimes our decisions span beyond our realm of control, and we just need to communicate with those people intentionally. So that's this simplified framework. Uh, this is what life without ADRs sounds like. And maybe you've had this in your consulting or on projects you're working on. We just always do it that way. That's kind of the, 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 big, the big thing, right? Set up a meeting, discuss that. Uh, they just felt like using PHP. I don't know why. Um, set up another meeting. This time, invite everybody. That's life without ADRs. Um, once we started putting this into practice, we had better controlled burns. We had no meeting wildfires. Uh, and this is where it really started getting good. We had better communication of decisions. Not just because we were writing them down, but because we had to be intentional about creating the records, which forced us to be intentional about our decision-making process. That led us to making higher quality decisions. When you're making higher quality decisions, you have more maintainable and effective technology. So it's a virtuous cycle that all just starts with just writing just writing these decisions down. A little, little bit of effort. So it's kind of a long spiel. Went through a lot of areas. If I could distill it down to just maybe one thing, I would say try this. Just give it a shot. On one project, talk to maybe one or two other people on your project and say, this might be worth a shot. Let's try it out and see what happens. 
Uh, if you're on a team that's already using a wiki to capture information, maybe use the Confluence decision features if you're using Confluence. Um, but that would be my encouragement. You just, just try and capture ADRs. See what happens after a month or two. Uh, this is all the places I went to to rip ideas off and consolidate them for you. And that's that. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> Any questions? Yes, sir. This is a little, little bit of a nit, but I'm curious about your opinion. Um, the notion of, um, since it, let's, let's say we do our ADRs in our repo, mm -hmm. and in some sense we have history uh, based on the fact that it's version controlled as it is. So what are your thoughts on... Uh, just go ahead and, yeah, it's yeah. like the same subject area. It's not an overlapping decision. It, it's a completely overlapping decision. Let's go ahead and change. Yeah, I love where you're going with this. Rationale, and then you can get a history of that versus, yeah, because I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying I know which way. I'm yeah, so let me repeat the question in the mic just for the sake of the camera. Uh, so the question is, let me try and restate it correctly. Um, suppose you're already using, you're using version control already for the thing that's capturing de your decisions. Do you really care about this whole change management process of capturing individual records and referencing them when, if it is an update to a previous record, could you just update that record because the history is already captured and this other history capturing mechanism? Um, my opinion is that's the best way to do it. I, I like This actually came up the last time I gave this talk. That morning I had updated. We had reversed one of the decisions. The uh, I think my Confluence example was should, how are we going to deploy Salesforce changes? And we had decided we're going to use Jenkins. And that morning, we had decided, like, nope, we're not using Jenkins. And uh, so I just updated the Confluence document because it has this history capture thing built in. And so I was kind of like, well, do we really need to, you know, build a history capture system on top of an existing history capture system? Uh, I, I guess if I'm trying to come up with a counter argument... It would be maybe the idea of having a URL for each decision. And, and so maybe there's something there. But then again, depending on how you manage your, your Git stuff, you've got you know your blobs to reference the history versus the current state. So I'd lean toward just make the change, check it in. You've got the history if you want it. I mean, it's only an argument I can imagine that it's easier to see the history if it's, you, know, you don't have to go into Git history. It's just right there. But That's true. Yeah, yeah, so there's kind of the issue of visibility, right? What's the easiest way to see the history of the decision? You know, do I, do I want to do git log or do I... At the same time, counter-counter argument, like if I've got a bunch of files and three of them are related to one thing, I've got to figure out, you know, it's like if you're reading RFCs and you want, you know, the current RFC for HTTP, that's what, uh, 75 something, right? But like, it started... Kind of 1.1 1 .1 was 26.16. That's kind of the HTTP spec, but it's gone revision after revision. I don't even know where to go anymore because there's no like one place to go, and I, I'm not going to read all 8,000 RFCs to find the five HTTP related ones that I want. So, so there's something to be said for having like one place to go and get the history there. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. Yes, sir. How many RFCs have you actually read? <laughs> <laughs> I am really excited. So, two years ago, I started a job with a with a startup, and uh, they were using OAuth two with JSON Web Tokens, and uh, I knew nothing about it. And so I thought, well, I need to know everything about OAuth two, and I need to know everything about Jot. But JWT includes JSON Web Signature and uh, JSON Web Signing, and like it's ten different specs. So I downloaded those 10 specs on my e-reader, got the OAuth 2 specs on my e-reader. thought, well, I may as well read OAuth 1 as well to figure out, are they related? Um, yeah, I, I, don't, it's, I like reading RFCs. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I sleep really well, though. <laughs> yes? I think you hinted on it a little bit uh, to answer their question. But uh, it seems like uh, one of the biggest use cases, like you are just starting a project, or you're like, oh, has anyone made a decision about this before? Ask how easy maybe when this is when you've been doing this decision making for a while and you have a bunch of these now, how easy is it to search through these and find what you're actually looking for? Mm, that's 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 a great question. So uh, 
it seems like one of the benefits is, if I can recap, that when you onboard somebody new onto your project, uh, they can go and find all the decisions that have been made historically. Uh, how easy is it to search through that? And that's kind of a mechanical question of how you store these. Um, that's one of the benefits. If you're using GitHub and you decide to store all these as markdown files in your project, then the, the regular searching features of GitHub will work for you. In fact, they'll probably work better for you than searching a GitHub wiki. So um, that's beneficial. Also, if you've got the checkout, you can grab it. So that helps. Uh, it, it really, I, like I should have really drilled on that more though. Like a big part of the value of this is when you onboard new people, they can see the decisions that have been made. And so they can at least see the rationale for how you arrived at what you arrived at. And so, you know, I can come onto a project and see that they're doing things maybe a way that's not my preference. I can see that they've thought through the things that I would want them to think through. And oftentimes that's enough for me to realize, okay, this is just a matter of preference and I can get online with whatever the project's doing. But I think maybe an even bigger benefit is a new person comes onto your project, looks at some records, and looks at the rationale and sees assumptions that have since been invalidated that maybe you didn't know to revisit. Um, so maybe it was, you know, we wanted to use this particular Amazon feature, but it wasn't, it was only available in US East and we're in US West. And then you forget about it. New person comes on the project a year later. Why aren't we using whatever? They look at the rationale because it's not available. Well, it's available everywhere. And so now you have the discussion. So it's, it's good to have those kind of in one consolidated place for somebody to read through, particularly when they come on board. It's a, it's a big benefit is onboarding new people. Thanks. Anybody else? All right, well, I'll be hanging around out here. Thank you very much for your time.